Good morning. Good morning. This morning I'm reading from the New Translation Bible, from the book of Luke, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. About this time, Jesus was informed that Pilate had murdered some people from Galilee as they were offering sacrifices at the temple. Do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other people from Galilee, Jesus asked? Is that why they suffered? Not at all. And you will perish too unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. And what about the 18 people who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them? Were they the worst sinners in Jerusalem? No, and I will tell you again that unless you repent, you will perish too. Then Jesus told this story. A man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it, but he was always disappointed. Finally, he said to his gardener, I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taking up space in the garden. The gardener answered, Sir, give it one more chance. Leave it another year and I will give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. If we get figs next year, fine. If not, then you can cut it down. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God indeed. Thank you, Dan. We have Junior Church. Chloe and Jolene, you want to head out there? Have a good time? Whoop, whoop. <laughs> uh, I want to welcome those that are worshiping with us online. Uh, happy that you're here with us uh, and, and being a part of this today. And, and I'm happy that you guys are all here physically too. How was your week this week? Good, bad, busy, got warmer, got wetter, a little bit of everything. Hey, it's Ohio. Maybe it'll snow this week. I, didn't, I don't want to speak that into existence. I shouldn't say that, should I? Let's not do that. Last time we did that, we had the dusting on the ground. Whatever your week was, I hope that uh, you remained on mission. I hope that there was a part of you that was willing to take a look at your life. How is my worship? How is my reflective time in myself? How is my prayer life? Am I studying? And am I able to serve my fellow human beings? If you want to find out where God is in your life, take stock of those things and what you've done in order to do that. I had a, a gentleman last night who asked me, he said, how do I keep this feeling? And I said, it's totally up to you. You have a, you have a, a choice to make every day. And you can make every day as great as your highest highs by staying in connection with God and not losing that. Or you can keep going through the circle of life and getting further and further away. It's totally up to you. It's true. We've been studying Jesus, haven't we? Again, <laughs> yeah, this is our third Sunday of Lent. So far, we've seen Jesus. We followed him out into the desert. He paused. He got close to God. It's kind of what I was just talking about. He got close to God and he wanted that relationship. He needed that relationship. It's got to be important. It's got to be for us so that we're strong enough when the time comes. Last week, we saw him grieving over those that are lost. We saw him anchoring in and feeling the presence of God say, these people, if they don't come to you or know you, they're going to be lost. He's grieving over Jerusalem. Fine, I won't come back until Hosanna in the highest, right? Which is Palm Sunday. Today's text takes a turn. It was difficult for me to read this and try to figure out how to tie this into the good news of Easter. Because it's not a really good news story, is it? It's not, it kind of starts really dark, actually. But what we have to do, though, is we, let's go back a minute. This is in Luke 13. Let's go back into Luke 12 and find out what's happening that leads to them talking about this story. Jesus is taking questions and providing his best answers, yet he's calling people out. He does that to us a lot. He calls us out to something better, to something new. 
in verse 52 in chapter 12, Jesus says, do you think I have come to bring peace to the earth? Well, that's something we would all probably agree with. He says, no, I have come to divide people against each other. That does not sound like the Jesus that we're often told about or that we've learned about over time. Jesus is loving. Jesus cares for everyone. Jesus accepts everyone. Why did Jesus say that he's not, he has not come to bring peace to the earth, but he's come to divide people? If we look on and go on further into verses 54 and 56, still in chapter 12, Jesus turned to the crowd. Tell me this doesn't sound like current life. Jesus turns to the crowd and says, when you see clouds beginning in, to form in the west, you say, here comes a shower. And you're right. When we feel the south wind blowing, we can say, whew, today is going to be a scorcher. And it is. You fools. Man, Jesus had a way with words. You know how to interpret the weather signs of the earth and sky, but you don't know how to interpret the present times. This is right before today's text. He then gets bombarded with that question right after this. It seems as though if you didn't really know a lot about Jesus and you're struggling with who he is, and maybe you didn't think about this part of him, you could read this text, set aside from everything, and think, man, Jesus is really alienating his fan base. He is really shoving people away. And what he's trying to do, though, is not to shove them away. He's attempting to tell them how things really are. He is then hit with this information about Pilate murdering people from Galilee as they were offering sacrifices in the temple. Their question about the people is... They must have been worse sinners than everybody else to be murdered in the temple. And I believe that Jesus' response is for all of us. His response is for you and me because his response tells us the answer to the age-old question, why bad things happen to good people? Or why do bad accidents happen? Is it because they were awful sinners? And Jesus answers that question with no. That is not it. I had to answer that question yesterday in the question and answer period. And I said, you realize that we are living in the fallen world. This is not the new heaven. This is not the new earth. This world is the devil's playground. This is where people die. This is sin and death. This is the awfulest it's going to get if we are believing in Jesus. If we go through the motions, this world can overcome us and we're going to just go to hell where it's going to just get worse. We have a choice to make. Jesus is trying to be honest with you. He's trying to tell you, this is the bad. He's saying anything that separates you from God is the bad part. He calls, in verses 2 through 5 in today's text, is that why they suffered? Almost as a, a rhetorical, ironic question. You think they were bad sinners? That's why they suffered this fate? Not at all. And you will perish too unless you repent from your sins and turn to God. And then he adds to the story, what about the 18 people who died when a tower fell on them? A complete accident. No fault of anyone's other than the tower falling. Were they horrible sinners? And were they the worst ones in Jerusalem? No. And I tell you again, unless you repent, you will perish too. It's not a, it's not a, what do I want to say here? It's not a hard thing to figure out. We know. Jesus told his disciples, and I love the way he used the words, you know the way to the place where I'm going. I've told you a hundred times. Repent, turn away. Don't, don't let that sin enter that door. Go this way. Go the other way. Find life, find new hope, find joy. 
In today's text, we see Jesus shares his call for repentance of whether or not people are worse sinners than others with a parable. Oh, I loved it too. If you break it down, it sounds really weird, but mm, it was like Jesus, he does things like that, right? He tells the story and you get this visual image and he's got a really great way of doing that. The man who planted the fig tree was tired of the fig tree not bearing any more fruit. This fig tree has done nothing for me. Gardener, cut it down. Right? That's what he said. We look at this thing, we can, there's so many parallels to the work of God in the life of mankind from creation. One of them I go to, if you want to go and read Genesis chapter 6 or 8 this week, go ahead and, and read that. He chal- Noah challenges God. God is ready to cut the fig tree down and start over. And Noah says, wait a minute. There's some of us here that do love you and are righteous and want this to continue and God gives them a chance. He says, okay, prove it. I'm gonna wipe out everybody but you and your family. Even though everybody had a choice, they could have gotten on board. They chose not to. They got wiped out. Repent, get on the boat. Don't repent, stay here and, and, and have the flood. Now we're talking about a fig tree. And in this new story, the fig tree has a gardener. The gardener says, wait a minute. Let's leave it for another year. He doesn't, he doesn't do the Noah thing and say, yeah, we are righteous enough. He says, leave it another year I'll give, it a spe- I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. If it hasn't done anything, then, then we can cut it down. Do you understand that in this story of the fig tree, Jesus is the gardener. God is the owner. We are the fig tree. Jesus puts a stop to sin and death. And he says, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute because what I want to do is I want to give it a chance. I love this fig tree, says the gardener. I love it so much because I want to take care of it. I want to give it special attention. I, I want to love on it in a way that nobody else can. And I want to give it special fertilizer. And what he's talking about is he's talking about the blood that he's about to spill with his hands and his feet and the crown of thorns that are on his head. He is going to give it the special fertilizer. And if they are willing, and if this fig tree is willing to take this fertilizer of blood, covenant, new covenant between God and man, it'll be saved. Now, unfortunately, the fig tree, fig tree can't make its own choices, but we can. Hallelujah, we can. I had a a conversation with a gentleman last night who... uh, wondered why it took so long why did it take so long i wasted so much of my life on on, on the chemicals on, on, on the drugs on the alcohol on things that were creating a his words a false happiness and once i let that go once i turn it over once i repent and let god restore me through jesus i've got to find out how to keep this I got to find out how to keep it and I got to find out how to keep it going. I I feel like I've won the lottery and I have no idea what to do with all this money. And I said, it's up to you. Every day it's up to you. Jesus is not broken. Noah, unfortunately, was. He was a human being just like you and me. He was broken. I don't know if God understood that he was destined to fail, but God sent Jesus who was not broken. He's God in human form. He is also the one who's attempting to give you special attention and fertilizer. He's attempting to give you his own blood that you might not die, but that you would produce fruit. This is the entire reason that Jesus had come to be a man in the first place. God tried it once, twice, three and four times, whether it was Adam and Eve failing in the garden, whether it was Noah failing after the flood water ceased, whether it were the kings, King David, all of the people that he tried to put in place to fix and right this relationship, all of it failed. 
the only way was that God was going to have to fix the problem of sin and death once and for all. He did that. He sent his son to die for us, to bleed out for us this new covenant blood that we would not have to live by the old covenant anymore. He fixed the problem. But unfortunately, some of us are still putting God on trial because we think that he lets bad things happen to good people. Whether or not we choose to see our fallen sinful nature uh, or, or even whether or not we are worthy of thinking twice about it, it's entirely up to us. We have an opportunity to choose it and believe it and then live in it. I, for one, would like to believe that Jesus did come to die for me. It is personal. That his blood was spilled on my behalf so that I might have an opportunity to have a relationship with the creator of the universe. You get to talk to that guy whenever you want. What would you ask him? I might have the chance to partake in a life that will never end. And I don't have to wait for this one to end to do that. I can do that now. It's not because I'm good enough. It's not because I went to the right church. It's not because I said the right things. It's not because I stood up when I was supposed to and I kneeled when I was supposed to. It's not because I answered an altar call at the end of church. It's because Jesus Christ has gone ahead of us. He's already done the work and it's our job to just simply accept it. Amen, church? We have the opportunity. One of those things, one of those things, whether we're on mission or not, examination, reflection. What have I done? Where am I going? What can I do? That reflection, that examination of who we are and where we can go is what sets the stage for the rest of our day, the rest of our week, the rest of our month, the rest of our year, the rest of our life. Are we on a daily basis bringing maybe kicking and screaming, bringing this new heaven and new earth with us and bringing it here so that way sin and death don't have the final say? Or are we living in Jesus? Can we live in him? Can we live in knowing that he gave it up for us? He's our gardener. He's asking God to give us another shot. Are we willing to take the special attention and the fertilizer And grow with him. That's the call to repentance that Jesus is asking for today. Amen.